What is endometriosis? Endometriosis is a condition where there's abnormal growth of endometrial cells outside the uterus. So the endometrium is essentially the inner lining of the uterus, which thickens during the ovulation cycle, then sheds during the menstrual cycle every month. With endometriosis, we have these endometrium-like cells that are growing outside of the uterus in various parts of the body but they still shed every month. So uh, that can be extremely painful. Um, generally, they're found on the ovaries, fallopian tubes, tissue around the uterus, ovaries, um, but they can also be found anywhere in the pelvis, bladder, bowels, and sometimes organs. Just, it varies from person to person. Um, however, unlike menstruation within the endometrium, the blood and tissue that shed from the cells have nowhere to go. And so then they get trapped in the body and they create inflammation, scars, and other issues depending where they are. The endometrium itself has many functions, uh, but two big ones are to A, nourish an implanted embryo, and B, to prevent the uterine walls from sticking together. Um, so when a uterus is not pregnant, the uterine walls do touch, but the endometrium essentially prevents them from sticking together. So when there isn't an endometrium, or it's been destroyed or damaged in some way, um, sometimes then the uterine walls will grow together and form adhesions and scarring, etc. In endometriosis, when the cells that are outside the uterus wall swell and the uterus tries to shed them still, the area around them becomes inflamed, and then that inflamed area can get stuck to another inflamed area, which creates adhesion or scarring. Um, and then the cells are also very similar to cancer cells in the sense that they grow and spread and can move to other tissues, even when they've been previously surgically removed. They uh, create their own blood veins to supply them nutrients and remove their waste products, and they grow nerve endings also that can increase pain perception, so it's really, really, really painful. This is also unfortunately a really common disorder. Um, it's estimated that 1 in 10 people have it, and it can, and the symptoms can just vary. They're so different for each person. Someone might have it their whole life and never even know it. They might have the lightest, lightest menstrual cycles that aren't painful at all, um, or it might be the complete opposite that it's incredibly painful, they're very heavy, or they might not be having it at all. So again, everybody is very different as we know, um, so symptoms can manifest differently. But this can be very, very painful, not only inside the uterus alone, but especially suddenly to be experiencing it in different parts of the body that aren't designed to handle that. Uh, so fortunately, our bodies are pretty incredible in the self-healing department, which is why the adhesions form in the first place. It's the body's way of trying to heal itself and trying to reabsorb the dead shedded, skull, uh, dead shedded cells. Dead shedded cells, that's a good tongue twister. But then the scarring can be re-irritated every month, and then this can eventually cause more serious issues depending where in the body the endometrial cells are bleeding. A common misconception about endometriosis is that it only affects the person during their menstrual cycle. And honestly, it can affect them at any time. Typically, it is worst during the menstrual and ovulation phases, but again, it can be experienced at any point throughout the hormonal cycle. It can come up in the form of flare-ups and be triggered by many things, food and stress being a couple. In fact, endometriosis is commonly misdiagnosed as IBS or Crohn's or other gastrointestinal related disorders. Um, and honestly, it's just commonly misdiagnosed and ignored in general um, because the only way to truly 100% diagnose it is through surgery and being like physically inside the body and seeing it because the endometrial growths don't even always show up on ultrasounds unless there's an active flare-up. So... <laughs> with our healthcare systems kind of lack of research into womb related issues and disorders and such um, a lot of doctors aren't really well versed in the disease and it goes untreated and then just many people are in extreme pain all the time and they don't really know what to do with it um, I had really painful I have like all the symptoms of endometriosis um, I had really painful cycles always. I always had doctors telling me that I was exaggerating. Um, they would just like, you know, be like, oh, it's, it's not that bad. Or they'd give me extra strength ibuprofen, which, you know, <laughs> at that, for those who have endometriosis and related conditions, it really doesn't do shit. And also eventually, as we also know, it really just eats up your stomach lining. 
um, and other fun stuff. So cut to many, many years later and I was having extreme pain um, and had to be taken to the ER and they told me that I had appendicitis and I had to have an appendectomy. So while I was in surgery, they discovered that I did not have appendicitis and in fact I had endometriosis and the endometrial growths had spread to that area and were pressing up against my appendix. Um, fun stuff. So I still took my appendix, RIP, which for those of y'all that don't know, the appendix is a reservoir for probiotics, which are all the good gut, you know, healthy bacteria. Um, so if you don't have an appendix, and you also are having stomach issues, it might be an idea to talk to your doctor about starting regular probiotics to help. So then I was offered the only really available Western uh, treatment options for endometriosis, which aren't really geared at treating it at its root, they're more geared at maintaining it and preventing it from spreading. Um, so those are A, surgery to remove the uterus as a whole, which can send you into early menopause, but some people do it. Um, B, to have surgery to just remove the endometrial cell growth, um, but often they do come back, so that is a surgery that people typically commit to um, having uh, consistently, like every six months or so. Or C, some kind of hormonal birth control therapy. Um, it's typically recommended to, to have consistent, to be on birth control consistently. What they recommended for me was to be on birth control for three months and then only have a period once every three months. Um, again, these are really the only main Western available options and some work really well for some people, some don't work well for others. Like birth control did not work for me, it made me really sick, just didn't work for my body, but I know so many people that it does work for. So. Again, like we already know, everyone is so chemically different, so it's really important to listen to your body and find what works best for you. We're gonna briefly go through a list of symptoms that people with endometriosis may experience, and again, it could be any of these, it could be none of these, it could be all of these. Um, everyone is so, so different. But uh, some potential symptoms include, let me get a good breath, because it's a lot. <laughs> Severe menstrual cramps, pelvic pain, chronic or acute back pain, leg pain, stomach pain, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, vomiting, bloating, digestive issues, loss of appetite, painful urination or bowel movements, irregular cycle or very heavy bleeding or clotting, uh, hot flashes, vertigo, migraines, headaches, chronic fatigue and adrenal fatigue, insomnia, anemia, painful sexual intercourse, uh, infertility and difficulty getting pregnant, hypersensitivity to inflammation and toxins, uh, whether that's environmental toxins or toxins in your food, um, and autoimmune issues. Uh, Autoimmune issues, actually endometriosis is thought to be autoimmune in nature uh, since those with endo typically have higher levels of antibodies that attack their um, ovaries and endometrial tissue. Anxiety, depression, and although endometriosis is considered benign, uh, bodies that are unable to prevent the spread of cells have a much higher risk for ovarian cancer. How does cannabis help? Well, the endocannabinoid system actually plays a really important role when it comes to the healthy functioning of the female reproductive tract. Uh, the endometrium has been shown to have a significant source of cannabinoids and anandamide levels are really high in the uterus. So endocannabinoids stop cell multiplication and they're largely responsible for preventing abnormal cell growth as well as destroying the abnormal cells. And that process is called apoptosis. And it's been shown in studies that when some cannabinoid receptors are activated, whether that's by our endocannabinoids or THC, they prevent cancer cells from multiplying. So for those with endo, apoptosis is also impaired. And since the endometrial cells act similarly to cancer cells, similar treatment with cannabinoids are generally quite effective. Endocannabinoids are involved in the regulation and prevention of cell migration, which is super, super important for endometriosis. Because as we learned earlier, the endometrial cells can migrate from one area of the body to another. So CBD can stop this migration by blocking the activation of the GPR18 receptor. On the flip side, however, THC can activate this receptor, which might increase cell migration. Uh, everyone's different, and only each person can feel what's right for their body, but this does suggest that those medicating with THC should consider counterbalancing it with CBD too. 
THC and CBD can inhibit the vascularization of endometriotic lesions. So those endometrial cells can only grow if they're able to create this network of blood vessels that supply them with nutrients, which is known as vascularization. Uh, the research on endometriotic lesions specifically is pretty limited, but there's plenty of research supporting that they do inhibit the vascularization of cancerous lesions, which again, as we know, have many similarities to endometriosis. So not only would this cut off the life force being given to the lesions, but it also helps the body to start absorbing the nutrients that were being hijacked by the lesions in the first place. CBD helps prevent nerve growth, while THC and CBD both help reduce nerve pain. Uh, the endometriotic lesions typically also deal with nerve innervation, which causes a lot of nerve pain. So some also deal with a deep infiltrating endometriosis, which is an even more painful form of endo, embedded deeper into the abdominal tissue. And these deeper lesions have an even higher density um, of nerves. So the endocannabinoid system already regulates nerve growth and the CB1 receptors are actually on the nerves that are innervating the endometriotic lesions. CBD interferes with innervation by preventing the activation of this receptor, thus preventing more nerve growth. Um, and when THC activates this receptor, it just helps decrease the pain. CBD helps reduce the pain by desensitizing the pain receptor TRPV1. As we know, cannabinoids can also help calm an overactive immune system, which can be really helpful with endometriosis since it is thought to be autoimmune related in nature. Um, so a large number of our CB2 receptors are located on our immune system's killer cells, and then when those CB2 receptors are activated, they prevent the killer cells from releasing inflammatory proteins, and THC activates those CB2 receptors. There are also really early in the work studies exploring the concept that cannabis may help with fertility in those with endometriosis. Um, a study showed that CB1 receptors were also found in blastocytes, which are embryos that were fertilized five or six days prior. So this shows the chance of normal fetal implantation in uteruses with endo. Inflammation is a huge part of endometriosis, and we know CBD can help that because CBD reduces inflammation by inhibiting the COX2 enzymes. CBD and THC are very powerful sleep aids. Fatigue and insomnia are super common in those with endo. THC and CBD both help treat nausea and vomiting, which unfortunately are extremely common with endo. THC does this by activating the CB1 receptor, while CBD does this by activating the 5-HT1A receptor, which reduces the sensation of nausea and also helps modulate serotonin flow to the brain. Last but not least, those with endometriosis typically do have a deficiency in CB1 production. As we know, there are so many different ways of consuming your CBD and cannabis, so ultimately it's just what works best for you. Um, there's always going to be a little bit of trial and error to see what methods are best, to see what works for your body, to see what doesn't. It's honestly like a little dance, you know, a little dance of communication. You're just, you're really, really taking the time to check in and listen because in the end, you are the only person who knows what is best for your body no one else. My personal preferred methods of consumption, uh, definitely first and foremost for me, always sublingual oils. Um, just for my body and in terms of internal consumption, that's just what works best for me. Um, it kicks in the quickest, it lasts the longest. Uh, I also personally prefer to have um, a hemp seed oil and coconut oil base with the hemp uh, extract. I really enjoy getting the benefits of all of the omega fatty acids, such, and also, you know, the higher the fat content of the oil, the more our bodies are going to absorb those cannabinoids because um, CBD and the cannabinoids are fat soluble. So that's just personally, that's my first and favorite way. Um, I also have a Pax vaporizer that I use for dry herb vaping, um, and especially for the intense nausea um, and when I just have no appetite, uh, vaping is is especially effective in the moment for me because there will definitely be sometimes too where I am not only so nauseous I am having extreme vertigo I've, I've honestly blacked out from the pain before um, it's really intense for those of you that, that haven't experienced it um, you know give your your endo friends a little extra love because it's really intense um, so in those moments of extreme intensity you know the more immediate relief of smoking or vaping is definitely very effective 
definitely baths like CBD, Epsom salt baths, live that magnesium life up. Super helpful. Um, also, any topical, I mean, it's not going to be as effective for longer lasting internal pain relief, obviously, but you know, when you're cramping that intensely, and especially with just everything that's going on extra down there, your muscles, your abdominal muscles, all of the muscles surrounding your uterus are going to be so sore and they're going to be contracting too because your body is reacting, you're contracting, you're squeezing down because you're in pain. So when you use those topical creams with all those lovely cannabis there it's gonna help give those muscles some love too and then hopefully help ease those contractions so that it's not super super tight down there and you get some relief there are also THC slash CBD suppositories um, I unfortunately being in Chicago don't really have access to those very often but I have used them before and they are incredible for the more localized um, pain relief so especially if you you really need to go somewhere immediately you don't really have time to wait for things to kick in suppository you can insert lie down for about 15 minutes let it absorb directly into the uterus directly into that area and then you're good to go I especially don't want to downplay how big of a role anxiety, depression, and other mental emotional disorders can come into play with endometriosis and other reproductive health issues. Um, not only physiologically, because as we know, our digestive system um, is where most of our serotonin is generated, like 96 to 97% of our body serotonin is created from the gut. So naturally, if something is wreaking havoc with the digestive system or areas around it, then of course that's gonna cause some issues with anxiety, with depression, etc. Not to mention just the emotional and mental toll it can take on a person when they're dealing with a chronic illness or autoimmune disease. It's exhausting and there aren't a lot of resources, but know that you aren't alone and there are still resources. And the more that we as a community come out and talk about the things that we're dealing with, the more available resources there will be and the more available solutions there will eventually be. And in the meantime, support is such, such an important thing, such an important thing. You never need to do anything alone. Using this medicine in combination with other lifestyle changes is definitely going to be the most effective way to manage and treat endometriosis as a whole. We'd approach this how we'd approach many autoimmune lifestyles and start first and foremost by looking at the gut. What are we putting into our body? What fuel are we giving our body in order to function? Because in the end, that's what food is. It is fuel. It, whatever we eat is literally informing our body how to act. So whatever we put in our mouth, it is telling those organs how to move, it is telling them how quickly to move, how slow to move, it is telling them what to release, what not to release, it is telling our body what hormones to release, it's telling our brain what things to release and what not to release, it's it's causing maybe inflammation or helping reduce inflammation depending what you're eating, it's it's literally everything. So it's it's very important. That is the foundation for not only endometriosis but for life <laughs> but if in any case where you are experiencing health issues always start there it's also really important to be getting all of the vitamins and minerals that help our body absorb nutrients um especially when we have all of these endometriotic lesions that are hijacking all of ours wow rude much come on come on so with these endometriotic lesions that are trying to hijack our nutrients, uh, things like magnesium, vitamin D, calcium, and vitamin K are going to be really beneficial to help our body absorb those a little more easily. Um, the only thing with magnesium and calcium is that you don't want to take them within two hours of each other um, because they are inhibitors. So calcium contracts muscles while magnesium relaxes them. So when they're taken together, they kind of just cancel each other out. Um, so while they're both very important minerals for us to be taking, uh, we do need to make sure that if you're taking it as a supplement, you take them two hours apart at least. Magnesium deficiency is quite common in those with endometriosis. Um, and since it does relax muscles, it can definitely help with cramps. Limited alcohol intake. Sorry, buddy. Uh, little to no caffeine intake, if possible, especially around the time of your menstrual cycle. 
Uh, caffeine is not only a diuretic, so it's going to dehydrate us quicker, um, but it also tenses up muscles. I mean, it's stimulating our adrenaline, which is getting us in fight or flight mode, which is essentially our body is tensing up and it's prepared for a fight. Um, so for those who are already dealing with a lot of muscle contractions and pain in general, that excess tension really isn't going to help. In terms of diet, um, things for endometriosis specifically, since it, it does heavily deal with inflammation, you really want to focus on a low inflammatory diet. Um, really, that means no gluten, no dairy, really limiting on the grains like rice, oats, um, quinoa, um, really, really, really limiting on the high omega-6 ratio because an excess of omega-6 can cause further inflammation in the body. And when we already have so much inflammation going on with endo, that's just going to irritate it more. Um, so I really, really loved peanut butter and oatmeal, y'all. That was my jam in the morning. I have celiac, so I can't have regular oats, but I have my gluten-free organic oats an organic peanut butter um, still making me so sick just because of its naturally high inflammatory nature and it just isn't what my body can handle. Um, so in terms of diet, I mean, everyone is different. And I still eat grains. I still eat rice in moderation. Um, but for me, I have to be moderate with my grains. And for me, I can't do peanuts or oats. Everyone's different, but that's what I discovered. So. Again, it's really important to experiment and discover what works best for you because you want to make sure you're getting all of your nutrients. Again, like also, you know, work with your doctor, work with your nutritionist or healthcare provider, um, get support. You don't have to do it alone. So, you know, while working with a healthcare provider that you trust, um, I would really recommend starting out by cutting out all of the high inflammatory foods. Um, you know, of course, still making sure that you are getting the proper nutrients that you need. Don't just suddenly cut out the only thing that you eat and don't supplement it. Um, that's dangerous. <laughs> but, you know, I would really recommend just starting out by cutting it all out. And very slowly, um, after about a month or so, working them back into your system one by one just to see how your body reacts. And again, it's like that dance of communication. You can eat something and you're going to see how your body reacts after like a month of it not having these things. And then you'll know, oh, this is good for me. Or, oh no, this is terrible for me. Because a lot of the times we're eating things that are making us feel sick, but we don't even know it. Because we we have this idea that that this is good this is normal and then all of a sudden when we stop doing or eating the thing that's making us sick we're like oh i feel really wonderful is this this is normal this is the norm and then you have a harder time going back to that because you're like i don't know do i want to consciously choose to go back to feeling like shit <laughs> which it happens it's okay don't judge yourself if you want to have a pizza it happens but in the end listen to your body a high iron intake can also be really helpful and important because those with endo usually do have anemia. So just making sure you're eating really high iron foods like spinach, lentils, chickpeas, cacao, um, or taking an iron supplement if needed. In addition to CBD and cannabis, there are various herbs that do help reproductive health and menstrual issues. But just like cannabis, all of them work so differently for different people. So it's really important to find what works best for you. Bevan and Melissa have created such a beautiful, resourceful community where it's so easy for us to connect and share with each other. So if any of you have experience using CBD or cannabis to treat a disorder, whether it's something you personally have or you're a practitioner using it to help treat someone else, reach out, let people know, let's talk, let's start a dialogue. That's the way we grow, that's the way we learn through open, direct, and vulnerable communication. So thank you all so much again for allowing me to be here and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and feel safe, nourished, and loved.